So we're starting, right? I can't believe, so I'm literally welcoming everybody to the Welcome everybody, it starts tonight. So like, this is it. This is really cool. Jen's holding up Alone Together, the amazing, um, and Jessica has a copy. Does everybody have their copy of Alone Together? <laughs> That's okay. Oh, Sadi has it. I'm gonna introduce our incredible panel and I'm thrilled to be here. I'm Robin Call, reading with Robin, and I'm very happy to be here to kick off, who knew, this festival. First up, Jennifer Haupt is the editor of Alone Together. Her debut novel, In the Shadow of 10,000 Hills, was awarded the Forward Review's Bronze Indie Award for Historical Fiction. And I'm just going to go in order of how it was sent to me. Andre Debuse is the author of seven books, including the National Book Award finalist House of Sand and Fog and his latest novel, Gone So Long. Jessica Keener's latest novel, Strangers in Budapest, was an indie next pick, a Southern independent book uh, bestseller, and an Entertainment Weekly Best New Books choice. Major Jackson is, I feel like I should wave to everybody, is the award-winning author of five books of poetry, most recently, The Absurd Man, and serves as the poetry editor of the Harvard Review. And last and not least, Sadia Hassan is an essayist, poet, and MFA candidate at the University of Mississippi. Her work has appeared in Long Reads, The Seventh Wave, and the Chattahoochee Review. Welcome to this incredible panel and the audience claps. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to clap for yourself, you know? Um, so we're gonna start with some general questions. Then the authors are gonna read a little bit from their books. And then we have some more specific questions. And I hope that the audience will share theirs. We can check, check out the Q&A um, towards the end. But if you have questions for the authors, please feel free to leave them there. So first question. How has the pandemic affected your creativity? I mean, we're going on seven months now. And what are you choosing <laughs> to seven months, eight months? It sounds like know. a pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that too. Um, is there something you'd like to share with us, Jessica? Uh, no. Oh, okay. I have to say I've not been through that, so I could share that. Yeah, but... Right? Um, so what are you choosing to put out in the world? What are you writing? What are you, what are you being creative? What has the creativity flowing? Anybody can jump in. Well, I'll start. Um, uh, so obviously I am putting out, um, this is my first anthology I've edited. And um, I have to say, I did not know what I was doing. I just knew that um, my novel had been canceled, the contract for my second novel. And I was just like, I knew I needed community. And so I reached out to some other authors I knew and was like, what would you think of putting together an anthology to support the booksellers who have supported us all these years? And I was just floored by the response, just amazed. And so it's been a really good um, just uh, experience, not only as a writer, but as a, as a human to just connect with all these other people. And it makes me really happy to see everyone here and just all these events, hearing people read their stuff, it just makes me really happy. And the book's been out for what, seven, eight weeks? Or I don't remember. Now it's since the first week of September. Okay. We were worried at first that, you know, the pandemic was supposed to be over uh, by then. And, you know, who would buy this thing? And the response has just been amazing. Um, and I think mostly because the essays are all in poetry and interviews are just incredible and go beyond the pandemic and just offer hope and um, mm -hmm joy and a lot of things that we need right now. That we'll always need. Yeah. The book definitely transcends the, the time, the time that, you know, what you intended. And that's, I mean, how great is that? They'll be reading it forever, Jen. Ever. <laughs> um, Andre, I'm going to just call on people. That's fun. Go right ahead. Um, the question was, was, how has this affected my creativity? The writing, is it, was that this? Yeah, yeah and like how you're choosing to, to be creative at this time. Has it, you know, how has it been affected? You know, I, I, um, I had a conversation with some other writers about this very thing recently and an image came to me that I want to share with you that I've, I've kind of had inside me for a while and that is of a train at night, a moving train. And 
Um, for years, my writing has felt like um, I'm in a quiet train car. It's actually quiet. And, and that's my writing. And then I step between the cars and there's all this loud movement and noise and wind and rattling uh, steel wheels on rails and, and uh, chaos. And, and that's my life. And then I go back into the train the next morning and there's the quiet train car, except sometimes the train cars are reversed. Sometimes the chaos is the writing and the train car is the, is the domestic life, the day-to-day -day workings. Uh, so the train is alive and well. I don't want to say anything positive about this damn pandemic because over a million people have died across the globe and people are suffering financially in horrible ways that we don't talk about enough. So I don't want to talk about anything positive about it, except I do find that the train is still on the track for me and um, I take sustenance in that. Thank you. I like that. Plus, I'd like to go on a train. That would be nice. Yeah, yeah be good to travel. Right? Uh, Major, you're, you're up. You know, it's hard to, always hard to follow my friend Andre. That's but why I, I put you there. I just I, No, no, I'm happy. No, I'm happy to because <laughs> I, I will uh, add to that metaphor and say that um, my art has been about um, stopping and seeing who else is getting on. And I think part of what is um, fascinating prior to this moment is that I, I, of course, I belong to several communities and, and to some extent, I think maybe nascently while I'm writing, but it's nothing like a, like a good pandemic to call attention to the worth of what we're doing. And, it, and even the most, um, even the writing that seems to be not about this moment, I'm finding great sustenance in. The poems, the, um, the, the thought pieces, the essays, um, it's, it's really uh, creating a greater sense of our humanity and how we are facing the challenges of this moment. And so when I go into my quiet car, I'm more than ever thinking about um, thinking about how I'm contributing to the betterment. He's, my friend Andre is absolutely right. There are folks who are suffering um, right now in ways that may be unimaginable. And I, I, I'm wanting for the first time ever, I think, at least explicitly wanting to have, which I think Alone Together as an anthology does, provide a, even, a, a, even a speck worth of hope and solace. Um, I think folks being able to testify to the sudden crowdedness of our homes or finding sustenance and, and uh, connection in the natural world, which is what I've been doing and writing about. I think we need these, these points of connection to kind of get us through to a post-pandemic world. So, uh, my creativity is is more or less leaning in that direction. I'm looking forward to to a moment in which that's not the case, but for now. Yeah, well, that's what we we look to our writers to make sense of the world and to put things in a way that you read it and say, okay, that makes mm -hmm. that you know, I'm on board there. That makes sense to me. Um, that's the best thing to me about connecting with the written word. Uh, Jessica. Yeah. Um, boy, that train, it sounds so organized. I, I, my image or picture is really this sort of uh, amorphous ballooning thing, air um, that I'm trying to sort of sit in the middle of it and just uh, not get blown away, I think. So it's a very, I, I, I like your train. Um, so I have found that I've really had to slow myself down a lot, try to sort of pull that circle into something pretty tight so that I feel some sense of, I don't know if maybe it's control, um, clarity, stillness, um, just uh, some moments of calm so that I don't uh, kind of almost lose my sense of, of inner boundary and getting pulled in so many directions. 
So I, that's kind of the struggle I have felt um, of, and it was very hard in the beginning, in the, in the beginning back in, in the end of February, um, I could barely sit in my chair for more than 30 seconds. I mean, it was sort of a bad comedy. And then, you know, I was sort of rewarding myself when it was a minute or if it was five minutes or writing, it was, if I wrote three words and then it was a sentence and it was a paragraph. I'm now sort of back feeling more in my regular routine of, you know, actually can work on a whole chapter. <laughs> um, but I had to really work through that settling down kind of process. Um, so it's, it, it had that kind of impact. I don't know if, you know, if that addresses sort of the creativity aspect, but I, but, um, you know, it's, it's life, it's the chaos of life, which, which I'm always struggling with anyway, but, um, this book, um, that there's such a variety of different voices and different experiences. And that, that's what I've loved about it. Just just getting a little peek into different people's um, experiences and they are so vastly different, but we're all sort of dealing with the same thing. Exactly. We hold the book up. Somebody's asked for the name of the book again. And yes, this is a nonfiction panel because this, these are stories in a collection in an anthology alone together. What's the subtitle? Can someone read it? Love, grief, and you know, you in the time of COVID. In the time of COVID. Yes. And Jennifer, Haupt is the editor of the book, and they are non. This is nonfiction. So I just I, I peeked at the questions. I couldn't help myself. Sadia, you are bringing this train into the station. Go for yes. it. Yes, I'm. I'm glad you did that. I was going to be like, hey guys, I peeked. Um, <laughs> you know, there's so much in this book about family that actually gave me sustenance. Um, at the time that I was writing my poem for for the anthology, I was in Virginia with family, full house. Um, and in the evenings we would go and go on walks. And um, I think similar to Major, just kind of like seeking out things that I didn't know. I was like, I don't know what this flower's name is. I don't know what this plant's name is. I'm like using that to kind of distract myself from being like, what can I learn about this new geography that kind of gave me a sense of control. Um, but in terms of how it's impacted my creativity now, I think I've just turned to stories about my family for sustenance of being like I'm you know kind of in Oxford by myself reading and writing and doing the whole graduate student thing but how can I connect with my family where can I find sustenance and so it's been just kind of creating an alternate archive um, and an alternate kind of parallel universe for myself that's filled with my parents stories and you know kind of just the things that have brought them joy um, in their time here and so that, that's been a great source of sustenance for me and my creativity right now. All about family. Was there something, uh, this is for everybody, that you discovered about yourself or reaffirmed something about yourself during the writing, the piece that you wrote for Alone Together? Uh, I can address that real quick. And I, I do want to thank uh, Jen for including me in this anthology and for putting it on and especially for supporting uh, bookstores. I still have never purchase an Amazon product. I never will. <laughs> the hell with Amazon. And I have choice or words to use, but I won't. Um, well, I, I wrote about in the essay, I discovered that uh, I, and this has to do with probably my sordid youth, and we all have some story to tell, right? I just, I find um, I am more comfortable in disastrous situations and crises than anything else. And so I'm slightly ashamed to say that out loud, but that's the truth. Yeah, I can relate. Yeah, can you? Good. <laughs> See, if we were together, we could all have a stiff drink afterwards to address our PTSD. <laughs> no, we're going to be looking forward to that at some point. Can you imagine? Yeah. We'll be the world's biggest author shebang ever. The whole world's going to have a party. We're going to have to be very careful, <laughs> all of us. Yeah. Oh, there is, there is that. I just imagine many parties or just many gatherings or just, I don't know. I don't want to get off on that tangent. I'm already on the train. I'm on my way. Um, but Jessica, yeah, do you want to take? Well, I guess for me, you know, and I've talked, this is what my essay is about. Um, there's actually something very, very familiar to me about this whole pandemic. I mean, I was, I did have a, um, a serious illness in my twenties and I was, I spent uh, three months in an isolation room in a hospital 
with, for, with a disease that nobody had ever heard of and everything had to be sterilized. And even after the hospital, I had to spend another year wearing a mask and gloves and not being around people. So I, I had, in, in a weird way, have kind of experienced this, except that I did it with just in the sort of rarefied world of the disease that I had. Yeah. And nobody knew what that disease was and nobody really, you know, when I walked around bald with a mask on, I thought I was being very punk. You know, that was how I tried to sort of reframe it. Um, so, so now suddenly everybody's kind of dealing with something that, in a way, I dealt with a little bit of. I want it's not the same, of course. Um, you know, it was a life death situation for me. So, um, yes, I do find comfort in that. Maybe, I, maybe this whole experience um, might open up some awareness for everyone about all those other people in the world that will continue to live and, and return to their chronically ill lives when the rest of us will move, hopefully move on to more regular existence. Um, but there, you know, there is that sort of underground world out there that I, I was part of uh, many years ago. So it's, it's been a strange reminder of all that. Yeah, it must really be like, wait a minute, this is, you know, this is familiar. And, and I like the way you, you bring that point around because there are people struggling all, you know, we don't always know, we don't always see. And uh, there, and I've actually heard from people who are saying, this has been my existence. And now mm -hmm. sort of in this with me, you know, mm -hmm. that I hear through the, you know, the author events and, and just connecting with readers. So a, a lot of stories like that. Mm -hmm. um, people are really sharing a lot. Um, Major? The question is, what did I, what, what am I learning about myself? Um, hmm. Or reaffirmed. No, know. no, 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 I hear you. Uh, I'm thinking about, this is the biggest challenge that I've had to face within community. And I'm thinking about the role of grace and how I really did not understand grace um, until like fully understood it until faced with something that, uh, and also the idea of resilience. I'm also learning, um, I'm reading people's eyes, uh, learning to do that, to, to read a truly emotion. Um, people who know me know I come from a community that likes a good joke and likes to laugh and we don't have that part of our face anymore. Um, and so I, I had this moment with a friend where we were just so um, kind of, you know, doing this thing that we used to do as a kid, it's pushing each other, teasing each other. And we pushed each other to the point where we started laughing and the laughing turned into that, you didn't know whether or not it was laughing, crying at the same time. Okay. And that's been, that's been some of the, some of the kind of nuance is that I'm not taking any facial expressions for granted. Mm. No, it is weird. I, I, you just you smile with your eyes. You run into somebody and you're like, that's <laughs> 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 you, it's me. Um, Claudia, same question. Um, what did I learn about myself in this time? Um, I mean, I think I, I think, I was too concerned about the world ending before, probably is what I learned about myself, um, and more so that the world hasn't ended yet, right? Like I think there are all, all, this, all these ways that people are still going on with their life. Mm -hmm. um, the volume of the world has kind of turned down, but people are still making way with it. And so I had to, um, I had to kind of have, bring myself back to center and be like, what does that mean for you? What are all the ways that you can thrive um, in this moment and not worry about the world ending. Um, where Where is the world beginning anew for people? Um, and that kind of opened up, it, it, it lifted something off my chest and like was I was able to get back into um, writing poems that explored more than just grief, right? Like kind of opening a little window into what comfort would look like, um, but yeah. Hmm. yeah. And Jen? I just wanted to say that also I, I'm just thinking of how everyone expressed um, isolation versus connection in their different pieces. 
And I, because for me, I really thought um, a lot more about, I've always considered myself a very solitary person and um, pretty much an introvert. And um, I think for the first time, really, I realized how important community was to me because I got so much from just being involved with this group of people who were all sending me these extraordinary pieces of their soul, um, you know, exposing how they felt isolated and connected and, and, and all these different things. So, um, you know, it's, I, I think, like I said, it's just really affirmed for me how important it is for me to connect with other people. Um, the isolation was never an issue. It was always just the connection. Hmm. Well, I mean, to put something out there that you've connected with and all of the writers have connected their pieces and then readers are, are finding this and, and are connecting with the stories, like you must be so, I mean, it's an amazing thing to create at a time when some people are having a hard time creating, but together, everybody's pieces just make this one big, amazing piece of work. And again, to raise money for the independent booksellers. Can you speak a little bit about that, Jen? Because I don't know if everybody knows what Bink is. Yeah. I feel like I'm going off script here, but I just, you know, I'm sure some people want to know. So I'm Bink assuming. is the, I forget what um, the, what it stands for, but basically it's the, the um, nonprofit group that collects money for uh, and disperses it to booksellers in need, to independent booksellers in need. Mm -hmm. And so um, what really struck me about, um, you know, back in March was how could I possibly make a difference in what's going on in the world right now? I don't have a lot of money, you know, I don't have a lot of influence, but what I have um, through my 20,000 years as a writer um, and through my blog, right, interview writers and book reviewer and so forth, is I have a lot of connections with, with, with people who have incredible voices. So it's like, how could I use these voices to, to really put something together to give back to the booksellers who have given us so much over the years? And luckily, I, uh, my first novel was published with an independent book publisher, um, Central Avenue Publishing. And I just called my publisher and I was like, what would you think of doing an anthology to support booksellers? Is that a crazy idea? And she's like, no, let's do it. And you know, it. never have gotten this out in, you know, two, two and a half months. If, it was if, fast, yeah. Yeah, with a big bookseller. Um, so um, I forget mm. the question, but basically it's Bink supports independent booksellers. Thank you. And, and I should say, and I don't know, um, how can people purchase the book to support the Brattleboro Literary Festival? There must be a way. There must be. I think bookshop.com. Right, bookshop.org. Yeah. Um, but is there, a, is there a link from the festival? To their, buy through your local bookseller. Okay. Buy through a bookseller you want to support because the money does go to them. And when you buy a book through your local bookseller, um, they get a portion of that money. Okay. Um, and all go to bank. Part of it goes to the bookseller. Hmm. So. Right. I mean, yeah. that's the best way you can support your community. There are, you know, we have, uh, well, well, there's five of the participants in this anthology, but there are what, 91 total or yeah, something like that. So you guys are going to want to get a copy of this and it makes a great gift too. And it's, it's like win, 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 win. I'm not going to say that 91 times. So it's a lot of winning. Um, so can we read? A, I know everybody's prepared with like a little bit of a reading. So maybe let's go to that and then we have some more questions, but um, I'm being mindful of the time as well, even though I know they can't kick us out. Um, <laughs> because after all, we're start, we're kicking off the Brattleboro Literary Festival. Who would like to read first? Jessica. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say one of the poets, because <laughs> I, I have, we were talking about this earlier, but I've been reading a lot of poetry during this time. Um, okay, so you all know that I, I, I wrote an essay about this time um, that I was in the flow room. So that's what my essay is called. Um, and I, I'm going to read, a, I guess, a couple of minutes of that. 1979, I had just graduated college. My hospital room, which we call the flow room, was about eight by 10 feet and designed to protect me from other people's germs. The sterilized room had a tiny window that looked onto a parking lot 
I could see a patch of daylight and someone's car fender. So I had to find ways to distract myself from the reality that I only had two options for getting out of that room one day, either alive or dead. I got lethal doses of chemotherapy to destroy what remained of my malfunctioning bone marrow. In essence, my doctors killed me to save me, and it worked. I got through the initial tough days of nausea and flu-like symptoms, and after that, my hair fell out, but I knew it would grow back. I started to feel well, and I could get out as long as I, knew, as long as I didn't get any infections, as long as my blood counts went up, as long as my immune system matured, but the timeline for all that happening was terribly unclear. I was among the first hundred in the world to get a bone marrow transplant for aplastic anemia, a rare blood disorder. My doctor said it, it could take two, three, five months. We would have to wait and see. Those, this waiting became a mental game, similar to what we are all living with today because of COVID-19, waiting to get back to jobs, hug our elderly parents, return to the things that make us feel alive. In my hospital room, thinking too far ahead could flood me with hard to breathe waves of depression, hopelessness, and boredom. So I tried not to think beyond the routines and tasks of the day, my morning bath, reading, listening to music, writing in my journal, breakfast, lunch, TV shows I watched at night. The next morning I'd start over. How long would this go on? No one could give me a definitive answer. It felt endless. Another week would pass, and despite my effort to stay positive, the heaviness in my head would return, making it hard to talk to people. In those darker moments, I felt like a bug in a glass jar, the lid screwed on. I was trapped, yet everyone could see me. I understood why animals paced in their cages. I began to pace. Thankfully, the heaviness evaporated after a few days. Maybe I just needed to give myself a rest from positivity, which is an unnatural state to sustain all the time but I continued to pace, it calmed me down. I was not allowed to touch anyone in the flow room. I lived behind a plastic barrier, day after day, month after month. It grew tiresome as it is today, to live with a constant unrelenting need to maintain social distance, wear a mask, wash hands, wipe things down, sanitize, wait to be released. I'm not an oddity as I was back then. No one heard of my disease or understood what a bone marrow transplant entailed, Today, everyone knows about COVID-19. I'm comforted by this. I'm isolating, but this time I'm not alone. Thank you. That's great, yes. Wow, thanks, Jess. Thanks. Who would like to go next? Andre's putting his glasses on. Oh, you, Sadia, okay. Wait, are we- Read a poem. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know you muted. <laughs> I'll go next. Okay. Thank you for that lovely reading, Jessica. No, thanks. Um, suburban Nocturne. Suburban Nocturne. Behind those trees, more trees which hide apartments whose windows I surveil from my own. A neighbor slick with sweat pulls dumble, ugh. <laughs> A neighbor slick with sweat pulls dumbbells past his bulging shoulders. Below him, an American flag slap boxes the air. Petunias shiver over the railing. How to protect one's heart from bruising under what is not afraid to startle, what sees without sensing. Four stories above the boxwood and cypress bushes, the long shadow, a woman pacing under a flickering porch light. The muffled cry of the Cameroonian mistress on her miserable night walks. Is it French or Patois? Did she leave him? Well, no. But who does not covet a woman who will not leave? Instead, she turns the shadowed staircase, flies up to her room. From my own, I slip into a life of looped dreams, filled with nothing but this hunger. In my dreams, I smell her off a lover, taste the sea in his ghost grip. All night, the sky, our sheets, his Sumerian crease, stink of capsized boats. Behind the night, more night. In the velvet stretch of dawn, I wake, non compost menti. In his mouth, um, non compost mentis. His mouth, a blue spell which stuns me. Behind those trees, a field of the living, native plants flowering in Virginia's heat. Summer sweet, switchgrass, blue eye, black eyed Susan. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sadia. Yes. I love that. 
It was beautiful. That was oh, gorgeous. Hypnotic. Should I go before you, Major? What should we? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Claudia, that was just gorgeous. I'm, I'm going to read the first two, hour, two hours, two minutes and 20 <laughs> seconds. I'm going to read two minutes and 20 seconds from the beginning of this essay called Vigilance and Surrender. It is a sort of elation, a razored clarity. It magnifies every car on the road so that I see the minute scratches on their hoods, the caked mud in their wheel wells. It makes every masked woman or man in the grocery store nearly four-dimensional, the hairs of their ears visible though I might be six feet away or more. It makes each traffic light hanging over the street as close as if I'm holding it in both hands, flakes of rust on either side of it, the glass lenses pointed at my vigilant self, who has always known the world would face a calamity like this, who has been waiting for it, really. For since I was very young, I have been expecting disaster everywhere and at all times. I'm driving south on 495, the April sun high overhead. My mask hangs loosely beneath my chin. It is a much needed N95 mask that I pulled from the pocket of my leather carpenter's belt in the basement. I bought this mask months ago to protect my lungs from sawdust when I was building my family a dining room table that can seat as many as 24 people. I did this in our house in the woods, 40 miles north of Boston, a house I was so very lucky to have built with my own hands with my only brother 15 years ago. He designed it and then he and I and a small crew spent nearly three years making those drawings real. After cutting down trees and blasting into a hill of rock, we built the first floor for my wife Fontaine's aging parents and then the three floors above were to hold us and our three children who were 12, 10, and eight. When we were finally able to move into our new homemade house on a cold, sunny March afternoon, I was 45 years old and had never lived with anywhere without a landlord. Late one of those first nights, lying in bed next to Fontaine, who was asleep, I counted the rented houses and apartments I'd grown up in and lived in as a young man. The number was 25. There are very few cars on this highway, though it is late afternoon on a weekday, the usual time for commuters to head home. At the Byfield exit, I take the ramp, pull over, and call my brother-in-law on my flip phone. He is a retired school teacher in his early 70s, one of the kindest men I know, and I'm calling him to tell him that I'm five minutes away that I was able to buy all the groceries on his list except for the antiseptic hand wipes, which are gone, as is all the toilet paper on the store shelves and the flour and the pasta and the bottled water. I am shopping for my brother-in-law because he and his wife, a woman also in her 70s, have the virus. They believe that she probably contracted it where she works as a nurse in a home for the elderly. Her symptoms came before his did. She lost her senses of smell and taste, and then she started throwing up and couldn't stop, and my brother-in-law drove her to the hospital where they put her on an IV before sending her home. Thank you. Wow. Amazing. How are they doing now, Andre? They're, they're fine, but uh, six months later, they have terrible lingering symptoms like so many people. Uh, mm. She still can't smell or taste. He can't hear. She's wow. She's dizzy and falling down a lot. Wow. You, unlike what the president says, you kind of don't want to get this. Oh, yeah. you had you had the I, I think I had it, but I'm I'm not sure. They say it was a negative test, but I uh I don't know. I I'm thinking I don't know if I, I had it. Major, after you, my good man. Thank you. As you were reading, Andre, I was thinking about um how I've had an open invitation to that house and that table, and I'm sad I haven't made it before this year, man. So we're, we're going to have that party at your place afterwards. We can socially distance. You sit on one end, we'll sit on the other. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> what an that's amazing. amazing. Do you have a picture of that, Andre? <laughs> I do, but I, I, I don't know how to get it to you. I don't have a phone. <laughs> um, there's so many wonderful people in this anthology, and thank you, Jennifer, for including me in it, uh, including Pam Houston and Jane Hirschfeld and Ada Lamone, uh, so many wonderful uh, folks here, Nikki Giovanni, heroes of mine. 
Um, I want to read um, my poem, but I want to read someone else's poem, if that's okay. This is uh, Susan Rich's song, At the End of the Mind, which is a wonderful riff off of uh, the Polish poet Czesław Miłosz's song at the end of the world. The song at the end of the mind. I think of you as a radio frequency, sometimes hard to find as I touch this illuminated dial. But tonight you arrive murmuring into my ear and half sleep. You offer a suitcase of small pleasures and laughter that somersaults across the country. In this time of shelter in place, we are fevered wanderers with nothing but an open screen. Handheld devices offering luminous ellipses. We heal the earthquake bones of our past, decorating rough mouths with new vocabularies, no longer deferred. As the world quiets, I'm awake to our longings, all that is left to congregate close along the shoreline, unbandaged and unadorned, to listen to the smooth rhythm and cues of quarantine radio. Hmm. This one goes out to you. Wow. Thank you. That was so wonderful that you read that one. Wow. wow. Thank you. Quarantine <laughs> radio. I think we're oh my God, in. that's amazing. This is called uh, Eleutheria, which is a Greek word of the personification of liberty. Yeah. Thinking about so much of this moment challenges uh, some folks' notion of liberty. Uh, but I think there's a larger question that has to do with community and hopefully what I feel like is um, the ever ever present job of us to figure out who we are as a country. And I think this crisis is another example of that test. There was so little to say of the iridescent grackles above the courthouse or the architecture of secrets below, like a fragile vocabulary or the inundation of idols when winter thawed, whatever was hidden out of loneliness. But what if we were changed at least once by nights of rain, by drunken bees in a glade of tufted vetch, by the fly tormented psalms of Blake edging further into the breath of our knowing. This is a country with a single dream. All the counties and all the town meetings and all the demonstrations amount to a soul creation. Last night, I pictured our shadows liberated from human forms. How do we know the color of freedom? I have a face the shade of maple pressed like an encyclic leaf in a book from a century, another century no one reads. I am imagining your fingernails, the great potential of your profile, how you may never hear the gentlest parts of my tumbling out of clouds. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we call it beauty, we the martyrs. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> I mean, what it sounded like when a whole like big auditorium was clapping at once, like imagine that, but this is good too. Sometimes we call it beauty, I love that major. God, that's a good title right there. Thank you, Frank. Yeah. It's a perfect poem for this time. You know, mm -hmm. so many so many lines in it are just perfect for right mm -hmm. now. I just thank you. I thank all of you for for creating, you know, part of the soul of this lovely monster as I call her. So. Thanks for being the grand conductor. Thank you. Thank you for pulling this together. I mean, just the power really? of the word to me, just it, you really um I, you know, you brought that to the to the core somehow. Of, well, I thought you know. of it as a novel because I am a novelist first. And so mm. I really thought of it as like a story arc and plot points and, you know, 
ending with Major's poem was just like the perfect place to end. And I'm thinking of where all of your pieces lie and they're just, you know, everything just fit perfectly together. It was just amazing. When that happens, when things come together like that in a creative way, it's, uh, it's just so powerful. Will you hold the books up once again? Everybody's asking, you know, it's, it's hard on Zoom. It isn't like we have, oh, look at that. Just ask. There it is, alone together. Really? And, and Andre, that your book, I imagine what your book would look like if you were holding the same I one. built this shelf 12 feet above the floor. I need a ladder to get it, and I didn't have time to get the ladder to get the book. So. Oh, I see it. Is that what's way up there? Yeah, yeah. well, that's another one way up. Yeah, I put my books high. I, hey. You've got to reach for reach for the books. Um, Good in your hand too. It's a nice feeling book. It, yeah, it does. It's got a really nice texture. They did a beautiful job. As you really did. Went to your publisher, Jen, um, and so the book is available wherever you, so whichever independent bookstores you support, and you can go to bookshop.org as well. And uh, we actually, do you guys have any final words? Because we know it ends now, but. Um, oh, Bill would like to know how long did it take to edit and bring to final form, Jen? Um, it actually, I put a call out on Facebook. I said, hey, does anyone else want to contribute to this anthology thing I want to put together? And that was mid-April. And mm -hmm. I had everything by mid-June. Um, so it was two months. And people just turned things around so quickly. I mean, I had to bug Andre a lot because he was sick. But I couldn't believe that he actually, you know, came through with this amazing amazing it's like a it's like a story it's like a short story um except it's real and, and he was like i don't know if this is anything as i could so um, yeah. right that's that is a really quick turnaround I and mean, when you think about it being written at this time and out in the world in early september and you know so good question bill thank you and um, any final thoughts from any of you? I don't want to be the one with the final word. I just want to thank you, Robin, because you well, have been such a huge support. This is, it uh, feels like, like the fifth or sixth event you've done for us, but, I, I, but you just, you know, you just pull it all together and you make it fun for, for me so I don't have to moderate, so. <laughs> just, well, I appreciate that you asked. Thank you. It's, it was, it's a great honor. And who knew we were kicking off the Brattleboro Festival, the Literary Festival. And there's a lot more coming up all day tomorrow, right? And I know Poetry on Sunday. So go to their website, find them on Facebook, and you can check in. And I'm sure everything is sort of taped. So if you can't go to a session that you really want to go to, you can check back and watch it another time. Support the authors and share the books that you love so much. I always suggest that. And this, this anthology really is for everybody. The stories, the poems, all of it um, speaks to me in different ways at different times and you pick it up and you get something from it and share it, and, um, which is what we do with books that we love. So yeah. Jessica, um, Andre, Sadia, Major, Jen, all of you out there in, in the Brattleboro world, Thank you so much. Stay Good healthy. to see you all. Stay healthy. Stay joyous. Indeed. Enjoy Vermont for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Robin, thank you. Really fun. Thank, thank you, Robin. Thank, thank you, Jessica. It's good to see everyone. Yeah. Nice to meet those I haven't had. You too. Lovely. Aww. Bye. Bye.